Well, years ago, this is the sort of thing that happened quite often, especially when some oil seeker happened to stumble upon a new pool. Now, such occurrences were very dramatic, but uh, unfortunately, many millions of barrels of oil were lost, never to again be recovered. Now, today, such occurrences are not very common because drilling for oil has become a highly scientific operation. And to tell us of the modern techniques in this field, both in the matter of discovering oil deposits as well as bringing the oil to the surface, we have invited as our special guest on Science in Action, Mr. Howard G. Vesper, Vice President of the Standard Oil Company of California. Welcome once again to Science in Action, Mr. Vesper. Thank you, Earl. I'm delighted to be on the show. And I think I heard you mention a moment ago the term oil pool. We might start by just saying that I believe most people have somewhat of a misconception of what an oil pool below ground is. Most people think it's a reservoir or lake of oil, something like this, with rock above and rock below. Well, actually, it's something quite different. We might visualize it by taking this little cylinder of small grains of sand. Imagine that these are cemented together with many pores in between in which the liquid is, uh, is retained. And we can show how the crude oil is actually kept in the pores of this rock by pouring the liquid in. You notice that it fills the pores very, very easily. This is what the oil man refers to as an oil pool. Now, according to the best opinion, oil comes from the decomposition of very small organisms, both plants and animals. Most of these are too small to see, but if we put them on a slide and place them under the microscope, we find that there are all sorts of beautiful forms, especially in these diatoms, which we see. All of these plants and animals decayed to make chemical substances and finally to make oil, which is accumulated at the bottom of the oceans and uh, trapped by layers of sand and mud. Gradually over the geologic times, the sand would harden into a rock which we call sandstone, which looks something like this. And the mud overlaying the sand would finally harden into a rock uh, known as shale, which looks like this. Well, now, if we were to make a very thin section of this sandstone and place it again on our slide and put it into a projector, uh, we would find that there were many spaces and pores and uh, different sorts of holes connecting the various areas in and that. Those are very important, Earl, because those are the holes about the diameter of a human hair through which the fluids flow. And as a result, we call this sort of rock, this sandstone, a permeable rock. Now, by contrast with that, the shale, if we were to make a section of that, a very thin section, and examine it uh, either under the projector or the microscope, we would find that the holes, the pores, were so small that fluid couldn't go through it. That's right, and for that reason, we call this kind of a rock impermeable. However, during the thousands of centuries that these rocks were being formed, salt water and oil were forced into the pores of the sandstone and gradually accumulated in this uh, rock. We can illustrate that by using a common sponge, which has soaked up here a lot of water. And as the oil and the rock were being soaked up, I think you can imagine that the oil, being lighter, would tend to travel toward the top of the sandstone or the sponge. Mm -hmm. Well, coming back to our sandstone core here again, the oil would come up here, and then it would run into the shale, couldn't get through with that, and then we would have it trapped at this point. That's right, and we can illustrate that perhaps by using a little sponge rubber model. If this were a cross-section of the Earth's surface, the black part might represent the shale or the impermeable rock, and the section with the diagonal lines would be the sandstone impregnated with oil. Now, over the geologic centuries, uh, the Earth's surface might tend to buckle, something like this. And if this were to happen, I think you can see that the oil would tend to migrate up in here from both sides, would be held in by the impermeable shale on the top and by salt water on both sides here, and we would have an oil trap. This is what the geologist calls an anticline. Now, in addition to these anticlines, you have such things as faults and pinch-outs, uh, both uh, which uh, hold the oil in addition to the anticline. Yes, we do. But the big problem is still how to locate the oil. It's trapped down there hundreds of thousands of feet below the surface. Now, one of the ways that this uh, might have been done in the early days was by means of doodlebugs or perhaps even uh, divining rods. Now, according to the best technique, a uh, divining rod is held balanced in about this position person walks around, and then at the proper point, uh-oh, the rod starts to dip. I guess we should drill for oil here, right, Howard? Well, I wish it were that simple, Earl, and we'd certainly like to find oil in San Francisco. Well, actually, in your work, you use a, a variety of scientists, such as geologists, physicists, uh, mathematicians, chemists, and many others, to determine just where you're going to drill. Earl, finding oil these days is a very highly scientific sort of a thing, and we use all of these people that you mentioned. 
we generally start with a geologist. And if you can imagine this as representing a terrain which we think has some oil possibilities, the geologist would be the first one to examine it. He'd look at it with relation to known geologic structures, places where we'd already found oil or new oil to exist, and he would determine that it was a likely spot. And then when he had determined that, he'd call for the help of the geophysicist and in turn the seismic crew who would uh, explore a ridge like this, for example, uh, with the seismograph. Now this is your crew out in the field. Uh, that's right. And uh, you'll see them. Uh, they actually put a, a small charge of dynamite down a little hole and create a very miniature, localized sort of an earthquake. Uh, there it goes. And that's that sound waves to going off that go down uh, below the ground and are recorded on something that we call a seismogram that looks like this. And this seismogram, of course, now, if I understand this properly, your instrument is set up here and your charge is also set off at this point. Yes. And this is a time interval. Now, up to here would be about one second. Now, I notice that there are some uh, different types of marks through here. What do those indicate? Well, these are the record of the reflections of the sound waves that have been set off at the surface of the Earth, gone down a certain number of hundreds or thousands of feet, and encountered different sorts of rock formations, and been reflected back to the surface, and thus measured as these wavy lines. You say, Earl, you can explain this principle, I think, very simply, if you just imagine that you and I were standing on the edge of a canyon. And suppose we wanted to find out how far it is across to the other side of the canyon. We would shout, perhaps, and we'd measure the exact length of time it took our voice to travel from one side to the other. Now, we know that uh, uh, sound travels about 1,100 feet a second in air, and so by measuring the time it takes our voice to return, we'd know just how wide the sandstone is, or the canyon is. And it's the same principle exactly that we use in the seismograph in measuring subsurface formations. In other words, the rate with which the shock waves go through the various types of uh, material in the earth determines what sort of uh, material you have there. That's right. For example, sandstone, we know that uh, sound travels at the rate of about 8,000 feet a second. And other rocks, uh, likewise, have different uh, rates of transmission. And so knowing that, as we come back to our seismogram here, we can interpret this by seeing that these various sections uh, where there are unusual reflections of sound from these rock formations deep in the earth mean a special sort of a rock formation. And this aids the geologist to tell whether or not this is a likely region in which to find oil. Well, despite the fact that this seismograph is the best way you have so far of determining where oil is, still you can't be absolutely sure that it's there until you uh, have put down a test hole to make certain. Well, it's an old saying in the oil business, Earl, that oil is where you find it, and you certainly are right. We have to drill in order to do that. Now, on this uh, model dairy, how would you go about that? This little model, incidentally, was made by one of our young producing people in our Standard Oil Company of California producing department, Mr. Don Rinkin. I think it's a very nice model. The derrick up here, I think is familiar to most people who've been out in the oil fields, and it's used to raise and lower the drill pipe uh, on this block, which goes up and down in the derrick. Actually, the drill pipe we use weighs about 25 pounds a foot, and it's about four and a half inches in diameter. Well, now, uh, in other words, you attach the pipe one on the other, and they keep going down continuously into the ground. That's right, Earl. Each section of drill pipe is about 30 feet long, and we screw these together, and since some of these oil wells go down as much as 20,000 feet, you can see that there are hundreds of sections of drill pipe screwed together. And down at the bottom, in order to do the real work, we have a bit which actually chews away at the rock and cuts away and actually makes the hole. I was surprised in finding out that this diamond bit has a value of some $4,000. <laughs> it doesn't look like it, does it? But that's right, this is worth about $4,000. And I think you can see why if we look at it carefully here, because these little individual chips all around the face are real diamonds. They're very hard. This is a special kind of a bit that we call a core bit, and it's used to rotate and cut away a section of the rock through which we're drilling. The section might look like this. This happens to be a core sample of a shale. This is brought to the surface and again used by the geologist to determine the kind of formation in which we're drilling. Well, now this bit uh, is of another type. This is the one you commonly use. This is the more common type. This actually rotates, it's screwed onto the drill pipe and rotates thus. It's a wicked sort of looking thing when you look at it closely. And these teeth, very hard alloy steel, are what actually cut away the chips of rock. Where does Mr. Kelly come into this? <laughs> Kelly's another famous oil field name, and what actually happens is that this bit is attached to the bottom of the drill pipe, and the drill pipe is screwed together for some thousands of feet. And if we can go back to our derrick here, it comes up through a rotating table in the derrick floor and attaches onto a square pipe that's called the Kelly. And so you, when you drill, you have a whole sequence of things happening. You have the drill table turning the kelly, 
and the Kelly turning the drill pipe down below ground, the drill pipe turning the bit, and the bit cutting away the rock. I know that sounds a little bit like a lyric from this uh, song, Old MacDonald Had a Farm, but that's the way it works. It certainly does. Well, now, I have a question on uh, these types of uh, uh, shafts that you make in your drilling. On this model, I can well understand this type of a shaft, but this one over here, with all of these contours on the side, looks a little bit different. Why all the bulges? Well, Earl, imagine that this is a cutaway section down some thousands of feet below the ground. The shaft on the right is the kind we'd like to drill. In the center, you'll see these 30-foot sections of drill pipe represented here, tied together. Now, in order to drill a straight hole, this should be in tension. So there should be a, a pull on both ends. And if I start this drill pipe to moving, you'll notice that the one on the right moves very smoothly because it is in tension. The one on the left, because it's not properly in tension, is loose and acts like sort of a corkscrew. And the net result is that we get a very irregular hole with these bulges. Uh, a very inefficient kind of a hole. Now, way down at the bottom, of course, is this drilling bit, some of which we just examined, but what about the chips that are left in there? Uh, do they stay there, or do you well, take them out? that involves something we didn't mention earlier, and that's a drilling mud. Now, there's a very special kind of a mud made when we're drilling these wells. It's on the surface of the derrick. There's a mud tank and mud pumps. And it's actually pumped down from the surface of the ground through the middle of this drill pipe right down to the bottom of the hole and comes out of the bit. And just where uh, you're pointing over there uh, is uh, the eyes in the bit where the mud comes out. And it picks up then the, the rock chips, the cuttings, and brings them back up around the outside of the drill pipe to the surface where they can be removed. And they look something like this when we recover these rock chips. These, of course, are also very interesting to the geologist because they're another indication of the kind of rock through which we're drilling. Yeah, very nice, but uh, one of the most interesting things that you've turned up that uh, to the uh, marine biologist would be this sort of a core with uh, clams in it. Clams that resemble forms that live today along the Pacific coast. Well, I can see why, because of your marine background, you're interested in this, Earl. And you're quite right. The geologist always looks at these cores for marine fossils or evidences of marine life, because he knows the kind of marine life that is most apt to be associated with oil. And so by examining these cores, he can tell whether, again, he's on the track of something that's likely to have an oil formation. Now let me set up a special problem for you, Howard. We have one of these anticlines. We know that there's oil there because we've sent a test uh, uh, a drilling down, and we're already now to start production. How can we control the project production? Just happen to have another model here, Earl, that'll illustrate that. Good. You'll recall that we mentioned earlier this geologic formation known as an anticline. If you'll just imagine that we have sliced right down through one of these, through the middle, this is the representation of the model. Actually, this model was prepared by the Richfield Oil Company, and it's through their courtesy that we are able to use it this evening. It will illustrate how an oil field actually works. Down below here in the bottom is a formation that has salt water in it. Here is the oil sand. You'll notice the darker color of the showing the presence of oil. And up at the top, this clear section, a very important part, is where the gas is accumulated. That's called the gas cap. Well, our gas, of course, would normally be in solution with the oil, so this must be the excess above that. Yes, and it's a very important thing because the pressure exerted by this gas cap forces the oil down in this direction and up an oil well. And this represents the oil well that we have, and we're going to demonstrate how it actually flows. I think we can also show that with a bottle of uh, this type of uh, excelsior water. The carbon dioxide in here, notice what happens. You press on it, and out comes the liquid forced the out by the gas. principle is exactly the same, Earl. And uh, if uh, I open up this well, which has been drilled into the oil sand, I think you'll see it start flowing. You'll also notice several other things. You'll notice that the oil level is dropping here as the gas pressure works in this direction and forces the oil on up the well. Now this would go on for some little time, Earl, until the uh, pressure in the gas cap were depleted. And then we'd have to provide some way to help the oil get to the surface. We would do that uh, by adding a pump up here. And I think you've all seen the, the pump in the oil fields that goes up and down this way, which helps to lift the oil from here to here after the gas pressure has gone down quite a bit. I believe you mentioned earlier today the amount of recovery that you could get by this method from a normal field would be, what, about 40% of the total oil there? Unfortunately, that's about all we would normally get out of the field. We never can get all the oil, and I'm going to go back to the sponge to illustrate why that is. Here's a sponge, again, soaked with water. And if I squeeze this rather easily, we get out the easy 40% of the oil. Then if I squeeze it quite a bit harder, you'll see we get a lot more water out of it. But no matter how hard I squeeze, you're never going to get all of the water out of that sponge. 
and so in an oil field. Some of the oil is always going to stay in the rock formation. Well, now, since two-thirds of all the energy used in the United States comes from petroleum or petroleum products, it seems to me vitally important that we get every bit of this oil out here that we can. You're exactly right, Earl, and to do that, we resort to what we call conservation practices, more efficient operational methods. It's a very important thing to all of us. And I'd like to illustrate two methods by which we can do this with this model. Now, you recall I said that the gas pressure gets depleted up in this section. Yes. Well, I think we can help nature out a bit by replenishing that gas pressure. And so the model illustrates what would happen if we had drilled a well into this part of the sand, and we're going to inject high-pressure gas. I'd like to have you just open the valve, and we will actually, that's enough, I think, inject some high-pressure gas. And I'll open the well again, and we'll see what happens. You notice that there's a very large flow of oil further down here, and a considerable increase in production into our surface tank. Now, if you'll cut that one off. The other way of doing this is to start from the bottom end. And here, we can exert more pressure on this end of the oil field by adding to the water pressure. So we'll drill a well down here and add water under pressure to force the oil up toward the well and again to increase our production. So I'll add a little water here under pressure and again open up our producing well. And you'll notice a good bit more production and more oil being produced from this sand so that we get a much higher total recovery than we would otherwise get. Well, this is called water injection, incidentally, and the earlier procedure is called gas injection. Now, the 40% figure that you can recover from a normal uh, well, that would be increased by how much if you use this water injection method plus the gas injection method? Oh, I think we could get up to about 75%. Well, that seems like the logical thing to do. How does it work in, product, in, uh, in actual practice? Well, I wish it were quite as simple as it sounds, but it gets complicated because people come into the picture. And if we had, for example, three owners of this oil field, suppose we had Mr. A owning this left-hand section, Mr. B owning the center section over to here, and Mr. C owning the right-hand section, we'd have something like this. Mr. A and Mr. C might like to do these uh, recovery methods, this water injection and gas injection, but all they do would be to drive more oil up Mr. B's well. And so they, chances are they wouldn't do that. Instead, they would probably drill additional wells here and over here into the oil sand. And we'd get more oil all right temporarily, but in the long run, we'd lose oil because the pressures in the field would be, would be depleted and it would be an inefficient way to operate the field. Well, how do you get around that problem? By doing what's called unitization. This is a procedure whereby all the owners in the field uh, combine their interest in the field and arrange to have it produced efficiently. Just the right number of wells, the right spacing, the right pressure maintenance, right gas injection, water injection. So we get the maximum possible recovery out of the field. It's a fine thing to do because each owner in the long run uh, fares better, and certainly the public does too. Well, now, I have seen some figures recently to the effect that, oh, in 15 years, we would use up all of the oil resources in North America. How do you feel about that? Well, that's a common figure, Earl, and don't be misled by it because that assumes that we don't find any more oil, that all of these methods for improved location of oil and improved recovery of oil don't amount to anything and a lot of other uh, inappropriate facts. What actually that means is simply that we have a good backlog of oil uh, with us at the present time. Well, now, in this matter of exploration and getting new uh, oil fields, I followed with considerable interest this offshore work that you've been doing, and I wonder if perhaps you could go into it, uh, just what's involved in that. I'd like to, Earl. Actually, we start out in offshore drilling in exactly the same way as if we were drilling onshore. That is, we locate a likely, lo likely place. We do that by using the geologist, by using the geophysicist, the seismic crew, in just the same manner as we've described, whether it be on water or land. And then once we've got a likely spot, we can do either of two things. We can either drill from the land, or we can actually go out in the water and drill. The first of these we have illustrated here, uh, it's a kind of an unusual procedure. This little diagram shows the shoreline off here and a well on the shore, starting out here and coming down perhaps a couple of thousand feet. And then at an appropriate depth, we put a wedge down at one side of the, of the drill pipe and actually turn the drill pipe in a slanting direction like this. It's called a whip stocking. And we drill some thousands of feet out here below the surface of the water and under the water. And if we're lucky, as this uh, chart would indicate we are, we hit an anticline and we have an oil field down here. Well, now, if your oil field is too far out in the water to do this, then you have to go to this other method, which is relatively new, and uh, how does this uh, very interesting platform work? Also relatively expensive, Earl. 
We can either go out in the water and build an island and put a derrick on it and actually drill from it, but more commonly, if you go out in the water, you do something like this. We drive piles down at the actual bottom of the ocean and build up a platform such as this model shows. The water level might be about here, 50 or 60 feet to the platform to allow the waves to break under the platform. Incidentally, we can only go into water about 100 feet deep by using this sort of a method. And on top of the platform, we have a derrick of the same kind we've described. Uh, we have the usual uh, things around the, um, the bottom of the derrick, the drill pipe, crew's quarters over here, and then to really make it modern, we've shown a helicopter to take the crew to and from their shore quarters. Well, I'd like to ask you one thing now, Howard. How is this going to increase our available supply of petroleum? Well, we are sure that it will, Earl, because we know there's a lot of oil offshore. But it, uh, it's going to come a little bit hard. As I mentioned, it's expensive to do this. We don't know how much oil we can find, but I'm sure we'll find quite a little bit. But I think the combination of things like this, exploration in new places around the world, improved scientific tools for finding oil, better recovery methods, all of these things are going to combine to ensure that we have a good backlog of oil for a great many years. And so don't worry about this 15-year period, Earl. We're going to be using a lot more oil by then, but I'm sure this oil industry of ours is going to be able to keep pace with it and keep a good reserve. Well, that certainly is a very, very reassuring note. And Mr. Howard Vesper, I want to thank you for coming to Science in Action to tell us about the problems in the oil field. Thank you, Earl. I've enjoyed it. Now, I'll be back in just a moment with the Animal of the Week. Our animal of the week is the kinkajou, and one of the nicest and one of the most strangest animals we've had on the program. He's uh, very much interested in uh, his name sign here. He's a special pet of Don McNeely. Now, Don, uh, this is an animal that comes out only at night. Is that right? Uh, strictly nocturnal, uh, Doctor, and strictly arboreal, which means, of course, that he stays in the trees his whole life. Perhaps you could pick him up with his tail as you were demonstrating a little bit earlier. Yes, uh, this is uh, unusual for a member of the raccoon family. Uh, it's the only member of the raccoon family with a uh, prehensile tail, which means, of course, that he can hang by it. Uh, doesn't bite, doesn't scratch, makes a very good pet. Makes a wonderful children's pet. That's right. Uh, he has a very thick, heavy fur here. It's virtually impossible for fleas to live in there. It's so thick and tight. Oh, you little rascal. He likes you? that. <laughs> I wonder if we can feed him something here. You have something there we yes, can feed him, and we'll see how he reacts when the food comes over here. This is a can of dog food, which is his staple in his diet. He also uh, rates a quarter of, a, of an apple or some grapes and some orange. Uh, anything we happen to have around the house. Oh, look, get at, look at him going that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's right come on out there, yeah. kinky, you little rascal. Well, let's see. These fellows live in Mexico and down into Central America and into South America. Yes, this particular model is from Peru. Now, he is the cutest model I've seen in many a day. Uh, this is about a full-grown uh, animal? Yes, uh, I'd, I'd say he was uh, eight months old, which means that he's matured as far as size goes. And uh, he has a honey-colored underside there, which is quite beautiful. Too bad we don't have colored teeth. Oh, he, he wants that. <laughs> he wants he hungry, this guy. He wants that food again, doesn't he? <laughs> That's right. Well, well, he holds on here. You can really hold on with everything. Well, how much would he weigh? About, uh, uh, about a couple three, of pounds? Three pounds at the outside. Uh, how yeah. long have you had him, uh, Don? Uh, we've just had him a couple months. He's right out of the jungles. And the uh, day we took him out of the crate, he was just as gentle and friendly as he is now. Now, your youngsters play with him all the time, do they? Yes, all the kids in the neighborhood, of course, play with him. And uh, if he didn't sleep so much in the daytime, they'd have more fun with him. But he well, really comes alive at night. Uh, does he take the house apart at night? <laughs> well, he takes the pictures off the wall. Oh, he does? <laughs> Oh, he is really active. I've never seen anything like this before. Well, for a member of the raccoon family, I'll say this must, most certainly is the best one <laughs> to be found in uh, South America. There's no question about that. We've had Coati Mundis on before, and uh, as they're youngsters, of course, they're very nice, but they can't yes. compare with this. Well, Don, I hope you'll keep us informed as to how your little rascal does, and let Thank us know you. in the future. You bet I will. Now, this is one type of energy that you are seeing demonstrated here, chemical energy. There are various types of energy, and on our next program, we will look into the problems of work, energy, and power, when our special guest will be Professor Harvey E. White of the University of California. I hope that you'll find a be with us then. Thanks a lot. <laughs>